Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply. Anywhere fans go to cheer on their team, there are behind-the-scenes MVPs ensuring everything is game day ready. We see you, Joe, fixing seats so every fan can enjoy every game. And Allie, who keeps her stadium running smoothly from the moment the first game starts to the last play of the season. At Granger, you're our MVPs, and we're always here for you with supplies and solutions for every industry and 24-7 customer support. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. All right, welcome back to the Celtics Lab Podcast. I am your host, Cameron Tiptify. I'm with Dr. Justin Quinn and Alex Goldberg. It is Tuesday afternoon. We have had, I don't know, 20 hours to bask in the glory. That is a clean sweep of the Brooklyn Let's go, Nets. baby. Alex and Justin, how are you? I am on cloud nine, Cam. I am so thrilled to see this Boston Celtics team coming together, uh, defying all of the gloom and doom that we were talking in October and November. They are looking like a real threat to make the NBA finals right now, and they are playing at their absolute best. So I'm having a great time. Justin, how are you? I don't have too much to add to that other than I'm feeling relaxed. I'm feeling mentally, you know, in a good place. That period of time that he was just mentioning, Alex, uh, with regards to, you know, kind of struggling with mental health uh, in the midst of really awful time periods in the Celtics timeline have firmly been put behind us. And yeah, I'm excited about the, the second round. I'm assuming it's going to be the Bucks, but we can talk more about that. Sure. So here's a roadmap. First, we're just going to gush about the Celtics for like 20 minutes. Um, then we'll talk about our sponsor, betonline.ag. Then we'll talk about the Nets. How could we not? They are, I mean, you got a rubber neck when you drive past a car crash. And that was one hell of an NBA car crash. Uh, and then in the lab portion of the programming, however truncated, we will talk about the Bucks and what is to come. But I'm sure we have five days off. We'll podcast about that in the future. So uh, let's let's keep the, the wheels a spin and let's talk about these Boston Celtics. Um, Kevin Durant said that the Celtics were the better team and the best defense in the league. Let's start there. Let's talk about the Celtics defense because the Celtics defense was staggering. Um, Alex, you can talk about any individual performance, the whole system, a single play. We're just celebrating, so go for it. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that stands out is really the whole system and everybody's role in it. Um, This Celtics defense is maybe the best I've seen, certainly in a few years, maybe since 2008. It might honestly be even better. Um, They are playing really, really cohesively as a unit. Al Horford has been exceptional all series long on the back line. Marcus Smart, defensive player of the year, has been uh, getting into everybody. Grant Williams has been a brilliant defensive spark off the bench and in particular did a great job on Kevin Durant last night. Um, And the big thing that jumps out to me is that Jason Tatum, the Celtics' best player, has truly emerged as one of the handful of, like, outright best defensive wing defenders in the NBA. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. The level that he played Kevin Durant to was really exceptional. It was like bordering on Kawhi Leonard level defensive efficiency. And I've just been really, really impressed with how he's taken a leadership role in this defense. Um, You know, to KD's comment that the Celtics are a better team. I mean, the evidence is pretty clear like that. The, after game one, which was a, you know, razor thin margin of victory for the Celtics, it felt like they were pretty firmly in control of the series, even in moments where Brooklyn was winning or where they were, uh, you know, closing in on a victory or closing in on overtaking the Celtics. It never really felt like the Celtics 
uh, lost control of the series after that moment. And collectively, I just don't think I've ever seen a team shut down Kevin Durant as effectively as the Celtics did. They made every single decision, every single shot, every single uh, thought that he had on that court a really difficult moment. And you could see it. I mean, he was just making like uncharacteristic turnovers, getting to weird spots on the floor that he was visibly uncomfortable with. Um, He wasn't in any sort of flow or rhythm. Even last night when he played probably his best game of the series, it felt uncomfortable. It felt forced. Kyrie Irving was nearly absent after that explosive game one where he had 39 points, the Celtics effectively took him out of the series. Mm, uh, I would and, counter, I think, well, we'll get to this. I think he took himself out. Of, like, yes, to take nothing away from the Celtics defense, but I think he took himself out of the series, which is something I, I want to talk about in terms of the, the Celtics. Maybe, defense. Sorry to cut you off. I mean, but. Maybe, I don't know. I, I think the Celtics defense really is onto something special. And there were could flashes. could both be where... right, though, because yeah. I feel they baited Kyrie, the Celtics defense, into performing the way that he did. But I digress. It's, it's possible, and we'll definitely hash that out. But I just think the level that the defense is operating on right now, obviously there were a lot of matchup advantages that they had, right? The Brooklyn Nets do not have the size to compete with the Celtics front court. Daniel Tice and Al Horford were cleaning up on the glass and um, the Nets have a lot of dudes that are themselves not particularly great defenders. And over the course of a 48 minute game and uh, this playoff series, the fact that they can be punished so relentlessly on their own defensive terms makes it much harder for them to engage at the highest possible level offensively. But let's not make any mistake here. The Brooklyn Nets, despite all of the flaws and all of the drama around them, came into the series as one of the best offensive teams in the NBA, period. They were playing a really good brand of basketball heading into the playoffs. And the Celtics sucked the life out of them. I mean, they completely took the air out of that team and it, in a pretty dominant fashion and in a way that has me really optimistic heading into their next round. Justin, pick up the thread. Uh, individual performances, system performances, individual plays, same prompt. Well, basically the thing that really stood out to me is I think this was, I forget who was talking about it, but this is one of the only examples, if not the only example where the Nets actually shot better, you know, talking about Boston's defense overall, but their shot selection and the fact that they couldn't get it done at the free throw line. I mean, we saw Nick Claxton break Shaq's record Mm -hmm. for the most missed free throws in a playoff game. I think it was like, zero for nine or something absurd like that yeah they they were very aware of how they were going to let the net score and even though they did let them shoot a better percentage overall from the floor they managed to come away with a win because they knew they couldn't get it done at the line and they knew that they couldn't get it done uh in terms of how they were forcing the nets to to play so uh, overall i think this was a really impressive effort not only for the celtics but also for Ime odoka jalen brown was very quick to give him some praise for his poise and how he conducted uh his rotations how he adapted to you know people say that the nets did not adapt they did adapt they didn't adapt well they didn't have a lot of things they could do to adapt but they did adapt and none of it phased Ime and none of it phased the Celtics they kept to their plan they they knew that the 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 only real plan in town was to keep the two stars going as hard as they could offensively and anything and everything that they could do to make life difficult for those two uh, they knew they weren't going to open up their egos and start passing the ball to people enough to win yeah, I will point out that on this very fun podcast a few days ago, I I said that I, ne- I knew Ben Simmons would not be playing and Ben Simmons was not playing. But to your point, Justin, the Nets didn't have that many cards to play. I mean, it was, oh, we'll throw in Blake Griffin in game three and like that's the pivot that we can make. That's the adjustment we can make. So let's not kid ourselves that this was not a good basketball team that the Celtics just beat first and foremost. Second, uh, Alex is 100% all right, uh, correct that the Celtics surgically took apart the Nets on defense. I mean, the timing on double teams, the positioning of double teams, when they were switching, when they weren't switching, it 
it all was like ballet. It was all perfectly timed. Yes, there were moments where Seth Curry hit a few threes. Of course, there were moments where Durant got his, but it really was like the perfect formula. I would hazard though that the best way to understand how dominant and uh, uh, disciplined Boston's defense was, was to look at the Nets defense because the Nets defense was none of that. They also have a professional head coach. You think they also have veteran players, but the number of times where players were dogging it on defense. I mean, uh, I said this on Twitter. I've said this to you guys, just watching Al Horford play the Brooklyn Nets. You can see someone who knows how basketball is played and who knows this play isn't working that way. I'm going to go to do this. Or my teammate is in trouble. Let me go over here. Or that guy doesn't know how to shoot. Let me put my body over here. And the number of active choices and decisions that players like Horford or Smart or whomever made on defense on top of just like incredible on-ball effort, it was so absent from the Nets. The Nets were so disinterested in playing winning basketball. Either they didn't know how or they didn't care to execute or they were too, uh, to borrow a phrase, perhaps it had something to do with ego. Maybe they were too sure that they didn't need to, but you never saw this from the Nets players. I mean, poor Nick Laxton and Bruce Brown. I mean, they were... They were good at some things, horrible at other things. Um, So I I do think the the Celtics defense won the day. It was not the the Nets defense that lost the day. But counterintuitively, the the way that I understood how well the Celtics were defending was to see what the opposite side looked like because the Nets' effort on defense was uh, like something you would get out of a team that barely made it to the play-in tournament, quite frankly. Um, Let's keep it moving a little more on the Celtics, and then uh, we'll do some other stuff. Uh, Alex, back to you. Talk about the the core four, just because we didn't get Robert Williams. We would otherwise include him in the power five. But the core four of the Jays, Horford and Smart, pick one. Talk about them. I think mm, pick one. That's 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 difficult. All right. Well, I guess we have to start off then with the obvious one, which is Jason Tatum. I know I kind of alluded to him earlier in how he's emerged as this dominant two-way player. But what's really kind of stood out to me is that Jason Tatum has settled into his role on this team as the clear cut number one guy. He knows it and his teammates know it. And they are completely in sync and trusting that when games get tight or when the Celtics need a bucket or when they need a big defensive play or when they need somebody who can make that decision to move the ball and initiate the offense, he is the guy that they're going to. And he, and he's executing at the highest possible level. Like I, I, in the last pod that we did, I mentioned that in some ways, even though Marcus Smart is starting at point guard and doing a lot in terms of making plays and assisting guys and getting people to where they need to be, Jason Tatum is the kind of de facto point guard of this team in a lot of ways, because every single set that they're running or every action that they're running, the entire defense is geared to where Tatum is on the floor. And it's on him to make those split second decisions, whether it's shoot, drive or pass, or um, uh, it's, it's on him to make those choices and make those reads. And in this series, he was right so often on whatever decision he was making, whether it was taking it to the basket to try and get free throws, whether it was pulling up for threes with a smaller defender on him, whether it was um, getting himself to a spot on the floor where he had an easy outlet pass to an open shooter or to somebody who was cutting. Just seemed like on offense, every single decision that this guy was making was the right choice. And then defensively, he took it personally. He said, I am going to guard Kevin Durant. I'm going to be the primary defender on this guy. And I'm going to make his life really, really, really difficult. He was contesting shots. He was getting into his airspace. He wasn't giving ground or allowing KD to get to any spot on the floor where he felt comfortable. Like this guy took it personally on the defensive end. And I think the rest of his teammates seeing that, that Tatum, the kind of de facto superstar, the guy who, if there's anybody who has the ability to genuinely make an excuse and say, hey, given the offensive load that I'm carrying, I'm going to need to take a couple of plays off on defense there's anybody on this team who has that excuse it is Jason Tatum and he didn't make that excuse he said no I'm going to lock in on the best player on the other team whenever they need me to do that 
And I think the entire team just kind of played off of everything that he was doing. He's had a brilliant series. I think he's set up for a really strong playoff run. And by the end of this, I think we're going to need to really reevaluate like who are the top five, six guys in the league. Cause I don't think you can have that conversation without Jason Tatum. I will, I will point out that we've been steady on this podcast. We've pointed out that he was top five or six in fourth quarter scoring all season long, top five or six in Jersey sales all season long, top five or six in MVP voting. Um, so we've had it steady that, he's that guy. I mean, he's only 24, but he is in that same class of Kawhi, LeBron, Durant, Giannis. Um, we'll talk about how Giannis plays basketball and why that's a problem. But I so Celtics lab points to Celtics lab. We had this right. We didn't dog this guy as much as maybe other people did. And um, other people can reevaluate all you want, but we've known. Um, all right, Justin, uh, next from the core four, you can have smart, you can have Horford, or you can have Brown. Well, I'll use Brown as an example, but this really applies to a lot of these these players. And what I'm referring to here is just this undercurrent, and it was very muted, but it was definitely there, of why isn't Jalen doing more, right? People pointed to the fact that his numbers aren't quite what they were during the regular season, and that he would sometimes seem to kind of fade in and out a little bit, not to the degree that, you know, in the first half of the season that, that created problems, but he wasn't necessarily taking over games offensively in the way that we know that he can. Now, I want to address that little subcurrent and say that that is actually exactly what we wanted from Jalen. And we could say the same thing about Marcus Smart. His scoring is way down. You can even say this about Daniel Tice, who is not, you know, included in our core four group. Maybe we should. Uh, the war on Tice used to be something that we, you know, kind of laughingly pointed to, but like begrudgingly accepted. And now it's kind of important that he is absorbing fouls while also creating this competent level of play that maybe isn't good enough for a starter under normal circumstances, under optimal circumstances, I will say, but the confidence in his shot, even if it's a little overrated at the point, at this point in time um, is, is back in the way that it wasn't in his last season in Boston before he was traded away. And the ability for this team up and down the roster, just using Jalen as an example, to trust each other to pick up the offense or to move the ball when the best abilities of a particular player are taken away by the opposing team is as crucial as to anything that, that you know Tatum does in superstar scoring mode. Also, not trying to take it over when you don't have the game in rhythm has been a really key part of how the offense has continued to function, even as, and this hasn't been given enough credit, but they have done a pretty good job, the Nets, of taking away some of at least Jalen and Jason's more favorite ways of scoring as much as they possibly could anyway. I will point out that I think the the criticism of Jalen Brown is common, but probably not valid. If you account for garbage time, he was fifth, and he, or so far he's fifth in fourth quarter scoring in the first round of the playoffs. So he's shown up. I mean, that stretch where Jason Tatum is on the bench and we'll talk about that ridiculous foul call. Um, I'm sure Celtics brand fans hold their breath a little bit, but there were times where Tatum was on the pine or Brown started the, the fourth quarter hot and he really set the tone for what the Celtics can do in the fourth. Um, I, we could do a spinoff podcast on what Al Horford is doing. Maybe he's vegan also. Like, I don't understand how he's turned the time back, the clock back so well. I want to talk Al about Horford Marcus. is not vegan. Al Horford is a big fan of grilling meats and other proteins. That's true. Just also, to be clear. Also the chocolate milk. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about Marcus Smart, who, uh, let's not be a dead horse. He, should, he was the point guard all along. Anyone who's listening to this podcast knows the narrative, but let's punctuate it with some stats. Uh, he averaged seven assists this series. That's the most in his career for a playoff series by a comfortable margin um, and had a, a three to one assist to turnover ratio on top of pretty steady scoring. I mean, his three point shooting is streaky, but about average for um, the Marcus Smart experience. I'm on basketball reference and there are some series where boy, oh boy, did Marcus Smart <laughs> just 
thank goodness that version of Marcus Smart didn't show up. But anyways, you have a player that the defense incredible. The I don't understand how he doesn't break teeth and bones and twist ankles of his own all the time because he's on constantly on the floor. He's constantly in the stands. He's just a menace on defense. But on offense, the composure was there. Everything that we worried about or overlooked was completely overblown. I mean, he played as well point guard for a team, Alex, to your point, where the, the primary guy is Jason Tatum. He's the point forward. You don't need necessarily Chris Paul to set the table anymore. You have that kind of um, super duper star who really should just have the ball in their hands the whole time, but they do need something of a point guard. And Marcus Smart was exactly that. Um, I mean, in this closeout game, I think he had one turnover, something like that. He 11 assists too. Yeah, absolutely spectacular. Um, he's, he went up against Swiss cheese. I, uh, have decided right now that Boston will never, ever employ an undersized defensive liability point guard or shooting guard ever again, because mm-hmm. just Go, go ask the Brooklyn Nets how that works out. That is the worst. Um, and the Celtics, other than Dear Peyton Pritchard, don't really have to worry about that anymore. Going up against the Bucs, that's a different story. We'll talk about that, I'm sure. But while we're on the subject, I would love, love, love to say hi to Marcus Smart. Good job out of you, Marcus Smart. Um, quickly, and then we'll talk about that online to AG. Alex, Derek White, Peyton Pritchard, Grant Williams. Give me 45 seconds to a minute on that. Got to be Grant Williams. I think he's been the most high impact bench guy that the Celtics have had in a long time. The level that he was bringing defensively was obviously, as we kind of mentioned earlier, really critical, particularly in the minutes when Tatum or Brown were off the floor. They needed another wing to defend Kevin Durant and Grant Williams answered the call there. And just the fact that he is now a genuinely lethal three-point shooter from the corners in particular. Like the Brooklyn Nets were making their defensive decisions when he was on the floor, they were leaving him open. That is no longer something that you can do if you're trying to be an NBA playoff defense. Grant Williams is too good of a floor spacer to make that a reality. Like you you just can't do it. He killed them over and over and over again. Uh, Shout out to Grant. Uh, I think he's been incredible this series. I think he's earned himself a pretty hefty amount of money coming forward and we'll uh, we'll deal with that when that happens but he's been really really great and just one last thing you know I think last year Grant Williams uh, was in some ways being misused as an undersized big Grant Williams is a big wing he is not a small big and the fact that he has been utilized properly as a big wing this time around is done wonders for his development curve all right Dr. Quinn uh you can have Tice, you can have White, you can have whomever we haven't talked about. You can have the Time Lord. I'll give you whoever you want. I'll take Fast PP just because of the defensive slander that you threw his way. That I Sorry. really like he is the weak link defensively, but as far as weak links go for a let me put it a different way. Uh, Kyrie Irving can defend. He did not really defend anything outside of game one for any significant stretches of time in this series, mm-hmm. but we know that he can do it, right? Uh, Peyton Pritchard always comes out and defends that hard. He always, always, always. There were a couple of, of plays in the entire series where he was like clearly taken advantage of because of a mismatch. But other than that, he has absorbed the defensive scheme well enough that he does know how to survive quite well and even sometimes even be a defensive plus which sounds insane for somebody who's under 6'2 as a guard position in the NBA and the most important part of his game is that he's found a way to do something that a lot of younger guys don't until later in the career if they ever figure it out and that is to come off the the bench on fire and be able Mm -hmm. to contribute to the offensive schema immediately opening up the floor pulling away defenders really just making an overall net positive that definitely won at least one game for the Celtics in this series and arguably two. So I think he needs a little bit of credit too. Cool. I mean, that's what you get when you draft a four-year college guy. Um, they know they're not going to make it to the NBA if they've played in college for four years and they don't know how to play defense. So um, with respect to Peyton Pritchard, who's like comfortably way taller than I am, uh, Justin, you're exactly right, that he brings the effort even if he doesn't necessarily have the physical weapons. Um, And the offense is spectacular. Uh, I just want to shout out Derek White, who's everything but shooting has endeared me very much. He made some boneheaded plays. He stepped out of bounds when he should have, yada, yada. Can't hit the broad side of a barn. 
just everything about the Spurs mystique is there. The defense is so crisp. The passing is so smart. The thing that I was praising Horford for, he does. That if Smart is stuck in the corner, Derek White is figuring out the third and fourth and fifth thing that needs to happen next to solve that problem. Can't shoot to save his life right now. Maybe he's got the yips. Maybe he's just a bad shooter. But um, vis-a-vis some of the other players that might have been on this roster, uh, otherwise, I'm so thankful that Derek White is on the Boston Celtics. Uh, keep shooting, buddy. Okay, let's pause the action to talk about our sponsor, our partners at Bet Online, the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, including updated odds on the playoffs, fights, and even next season's futures. Don't forget that baseball is back and the start of Major League Baseball is finally here. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino and poker games. It is super easy to get started. Just head to the website today and use your mobile device to join. Use our promo code CLNS50 to receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. Uh, we are going to carve out some time to talk about the Brooklyn Nets, but because this is the Celtics Lab podcast, Let's just wrap up this first series by talking about the coaching because the coaching and the front office deserve some gas. Um, Alex, I'll go to you first. And then in the next segment, Justin gets first bite at all the apples. Alex, say something about the coach. Say something about the front office. We know how to lock Patty's ass up. Um, (laughs) I am just so thrilled that Ibe Odoka got his revenge on the slanderous comments directed his way by Kevin Durant in the Olympics. Um, No, all jokes aside, Ime has been really good. And I think the thing that stands out to me most is actually not an X's and O's thing or a tactical thing, which he's both been great at. It's just the fact that this guy carries himself with a ton of confidence and the team has fed off of that. Um, Ime was quoted in a press conference yesterday, said um, he, and he said this kind of repeatedly throughout the series and through kind of these past few weeks, we're not ducking anybody. Hi, everyone. Just wanted to pause the action to tell you about our friends at Poker Chill, one of the best places for online poker gaming. Poker Chill is an online poker app with built-in video chat. Host private poker games without using Zoom or other screens. Poker Chill has video chat built right into the game on your phone or tablet. A perfect way to hang out remote with your friends or family, and just as fun and real as live poker, all from your phone or tablet. Perfect for both beginners and advanced games. Best of all, it's super easy to get started and takes just three taps to set up. Poker Chill is available now for iPhone and iPad. Get started by downloading the Poker Chill app. And if you use our promo code CLAB, C-L-A-B, your first five hours are completely free. As a parent, you have so much free time. No, you don't. With a Walmart Plus membership, squeeze in shopping when you can. Get groceries for the same low prices in-store plus free delivery. Waiting for the bus? Order more coffee. Bathroom break? Add tissue to your cart. We all do it. And when you wake up at 3 a.m. and remember you need kumquats, shop then too. Get fresh groceries and more for the same low prices in-store with Walmart Plus free delivery. $35 order minimum. Restrictions apply. See membership details. He made it very clear that the Celtics were not interested in running away from anybody or in trying to play the seeding game and uh, get a favorable matchup. They wanted to roll the ball out there and beat whoever was in front of them. That was the priority, and they came and prepared to do that, and they did exactly that. Um, I think the air of confidence that he carries himself with was at times considered to be a little rough around the edges this year. A lot of people thought that that confidence was a little too much. And when he was openly kind of talking about players not responding uh, to that, to the level that he needed them to at the beginning of the year and using the press to call them out, that ruffled a lot of feathers, but it may have ruffled feathers in the media and the fans community. The only thing that it did for the Boston Celtics is energize the players and cause them to push their individual game to a higher level. I really like the culture change and the accountability that Udoka brought to this. And we'll talk about this a little later, but I think um, it stands in pretty stark contrast to Steve Nash and uh, his demeanor on the Brooklyn Nets sideline in this series. So 
Really great job, Ime. Uh, from an X's and O's standpoint, you brought out a brilliant game plan to shut down Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving and make it so that the role players didn't have enough rhythm to really impact at a super high level. Um, but more importantly, he reset the vibes, he reset the culture, and these guys are feeding off of it in a way that's really impressive to watch. Justin? I'm going to focus more on Brad. I won't do the eternal victory lap for him doing all of the things that I wanted more or less the Celtics to have done this season. Apart from, I will bring up that even the much maligned Daniel Tice makes too much money. Why did they bring him back? Would we realistically have been able to survive the first round if we had Enos Cantor in the same role? If you can hear that in the background, by the way, that is a metal recycling service in Mexico City. They haunt me every day. Uh, I thought it was a cat. Amazing. No, it's not, a, it's not a cat. There's a techno remix of it. I'll see if I can find it for, for the podcast listeners uh, later today when this comes out. It's pretty obnoxious. I apologize uh, for anyone who's listening. It's just, well, it's Justin, part of life. If, if it's any consolation to you, um, Ennis Cantor being on this team for a playoff series against Kevin Durant would haunt me every day. And the thought is haunting me every day. So Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, we, 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 ha- we have to give bread flowers for that. But there's also been some discussion about other aspects that we should be taking into consideration, which is not giving up on large chunks of the, the players who are still on this team, the, particularly some of the younger players on this team, particularly splitting up the Jays when everyone was chattering about it. But even down to people like Peyton Pritchard, uh, I, I want us to be more patient with other people like Aaron Neesmith when they finally do have an opportunity to get mixed in and actually get some playing time. I think we need to be a little bit more open-minded about what what Brad can do as, as a general manager, as a president of basketball operations with this team, just because of the fact that now he has shown us he is not an idiot. You know, he is not just some guy they put in that position so they could save money as that narrative was going and really should be seen at least so far for what he's done with this team in such a short amount of time as one of the better uh, team presidents in the league. Uh, And just to tack on one more thing to that, if people are excited about the possibility of what the Celtics young players look like next year, you have no idea what's coming in Johan Bigarin. That guy, look forward to that guy. I'm looking forward to never pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, I, I will just add that I think Brad Stevens, it makes sense that he's good at the things that he has been good at in Boston because of what he did at Butler, that he took uh, pennies and turned them into dollars in mid-major players. And he scouted talent in a way that was well above his weight class. And so that makes sense to me that in the mid 20 teens, he turned what should have been lottery teams into Eastern conference finalists. And he turned uh, a weird roster into a streamlined roster. That makes sense to me. But Alex, to your point, Ima Odoka is the perfect coach for this moment. Yes, he's a rookie head coach. Yes, the Celtics could get swept in the next round. But the accountability, the toughness, and the time that he has put in, I think maybe it was the Hoop Collective, they were talking about Ime Odoka has been going up against Kevin Durant for a decade. He knows exactly what Kevin Durant wants to do. Um, with respect to Brad Stevens, having a former player who's played in the modern NBA and who understands what a modern NBA player needs in terms of guidance and accountability I think that that logical next step was was there, and I think it it really uh, came clean uh, out in the end. I mean, it was very obvious that the Celtics bought into the defensive system. They bought into what the hierarchy on offense looked like and what the passing regiment looked like. Um, so, man, I mean, we could we could probably gawk for the next five days if we needed to about what we just saw. But let's pause. We're going to talk about the Nets, and then presumably we're going to talk about the Bucs. It's Tuesday afternoon. We can't confirm that they're going to play the Bucs, but they're probably going to play the Bucs. Um, if you made it this far of the podcast, please, please, please consider rating and reviewing us on iTunes or Spotify. It makes a huge difference to content creators. Anyways, uh, let's eulogize the Nets for a little bit, and um, I'm just going to sip my tea for a moment uh, to, to make it clear how we feel about the Brooklyn Nets. Um, dibs on a little bit of Kyrie, but 
uh, Justin, you get to go first. Talk about Nash, talk about Durant, talk about Claxton, whatever you want about the Nets. You could talk about Kyrie too, but Dr. Quinn. What are they going to do now? That's the thing that is fascinating me. I, you made this analogy of, of rubbernecking at an accident. And it's, I normally, I would be very, you, you know me, like I don't like the opportunity of talent leaving NBA roster. If someone was ever stupid enough to put me in charge of an NBA organization, I am always going to be super aggressive trying to preserve high level talent on the roster. What do you do to do that? Even if you did take my, my perspective, like I would love to move off of Kyrie. I would probably want to move off of KD just because I don't think he's as dinged up as some people assume he is in terms of like the permanent ability of him to play basketball. But it's clear he can't be the guy who's going to like be like a LeBron like figure who's just going to put the team on his back and drag them through the end of the regular season into the playoffs and then win it's already passed that for him. So if you do want to do this with him moving forward, you have to kind of keep him in bubble wrap throughout the rest of the regular season. So he's nice and fresh for the, for the postseason. And with that in mind, you know, you can't, I don't think move Kyrie without pissing off KD. You can't really move KD too easily without upsetting the balance of what you to build around Kyrie. And if you do keep Kyrie, you have to give him a quarter of a billion dollars, most likely, or very close to it. Um, maybe you could find a way to work in some clauses about availability based on what's happened so far this season. But apart from that, it's a really horrible situation being for an organization. And I don't feel any happiness in my heart for our friends who are Brooklyn Nets fans who had to go through exactly what we went through with the Kyrie experience and realistically ending in a worse position because at least the Celtics had a way, a core that was left that they could move on from. And I just don't see how they do that with the Nets. Well, uh, Justin, the obvious answer is that they give a max deal to Bruce Brown, who was the Nets' best player in this series, aside from Kevin Durant. Um, I do think I'm, – I'm not quite there yet. I think that as long as you have Kevin Durant on your team, you're going to have an opportunity to recruit some really high-quality talent to come in and fill those spots. The cap gymnastics are tough, um, but Sean Marks has proven pretty adept at moving stuff around when he needs to. The big question for me is – what is going to be the plan with the head coach going forward, Steve Nash, who I think most people would agree, even though Stan Van Gundy did mention uh, and had a pretty epic Twitter thread uh, showing that Nash was not as absent as maybe some po- folks would uh, would assume he was. Nash did get outcoached in this series. I think that's pretty plain. And I think there is some concern around whether he can be the guy for this team. He's now in his second year as a head coach. He was hired in all likelihood because Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant specifically wanted Steve Nash to be the coach. And there's at least some uh, suggestion that they wanted Steve Nash to be the coach primarily because Steve Nash would be somewhat hands off as a coach, that he would kind of let Durant and Kyrie do their thing, that he wouldn't spend a whole lot of time up implementing a really rigorous system that would force them to play a certain way or would force them to, you know, defend in, you know, this manner, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, you know, there's track records of coaches doing that and succeeding with the right personnel. Let's be clear. That's not necessarily an insane strategy to have a more hands-off approach, particularly when you're dealing with star players. But with this Brooklyn Nets core, with the fact that there are some really volatile personalities operating, and with the fact that some of the young guys that the Brooklyn Nets are relying on really need that kind of a structure and that kind of accountability and discipline to thrive in the roles that they're looking for. I think of like a Nick Claxton, for example, a guy who I think has legitimate potential to be a pretty high quality starting level player in the NBA. Nick Claxton is a dude who needs structure to maximize his talents. Seth Curry is a dude who needs structure to maximize his talents. The same is true of Bruce Brown. And they show that in flashes. But Steve Nash's system, the current, the system that uh, they applied in this series and really for this whole year, obviously with a lot of injuries and absences that you need to take into account for as well, th- that system doesn't really give those guys the opportunities to maximize those talents and instead is 
very much focused on like, how can we get Durant and Irving to the places where they need to be? And in a vacuum, that's totally fine. If you're trying to like cater to your superstars and attract more superstars to your market, But when it comes to playoff basketball, you really do need to have at least some level of discipline and culture in place for the guys who maybe will need to step up in ways that you don't necessarily expect them to. I imagine Steve Nash will be the Brooklyn Nets coach next year. In fact, Joe Sy seems to have all but confirmed it. I don't think there's a plan afoot to fire Steve Nash, but I'm not sure that Steve Nash can be the head coach of a team that has legitimate championship aspirations. It doesn't matter who the coach is. The Nets will never win a title as currently constructed. Kyrie Irving has proven himself unable to, to learn as an adult, to take accountability for his actions, even in his quote that's going around where uh, he was a distraction and he's making it clear. He's saying, you know, we exercised every way for me to play and it was really emotionally taxing. Pull the thread, you idiot. It's just, it's, it, it, I can't imagine being a fan of this person and the fan player contract being broken so emphatically. Likewise, Ben Simmons plays for the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, the person who hates playing professional basketball, maybe less than Kyrie Irving because they brought him James Harden and he didn't like playing with Kyrie Irving so much. They brought in that miserable, <laughs> miserable player. So now the Brooklyn Nets have the following players, Kevin Durant entering season 15 he's still an mvp caliber player but he's not lebron he is not going to age the same way and yes he can put up 35 and 5 but he doesn't change the nature of the game and we just saw that in the series Kyrie irving alex to your point is either going to play for the brooklyn nets or not at all next season because he's not getting traded he's going to opt into his 36 million dollar player option and they're going to have to run it back with a dude who takes no accountability who can't play defense and also is made of glass and will probably have to deal with some injury woes And then they have Ben Simmons, who maybe will never play professional basketball again. And even if he does, there is a lot to unpack because we don't know what version of Ben Simmons is out there or potentially out there. So with respect to Steve Nash, it doesn't matter because this Brooklyn Nets team is screwed. And the New York Knicks have a better chance of winning a title than the Brooklyn Nets. Oh um, my God! That hold on. Wait, what? You I just say the bold. New York Knicks have a better title chance than a team that has Kevin Durant. This is too much. This is too much slander. <laughs> what are the Nets? What are the Nets going to do? What could they possibly they have do? Kevin Durant. <laughs> what did that do for them this series? How could that I possibly? <laughs> so I will. I will push back a little bit in that I think that as I was saying. I don't know if it was the last part of the pod before that. They they a, a few things they need. They need Joe Harris healthy. A healthy Joe Harris makes this a much, much more. Why? Better. They have Seth Curry. Yeah, but Seth Joe Curry Harris has some big. limitations. Seth Curry was playing on one leg. Seth Curry is but they have the same, shooter. they have two versions one of the shooter. same player. Yeah, but if you have two yeah. shooters on the court, if you so have, then a they have court, so they have three undersized guards who can't play defense. Joe Joe, Joe Harris is not, he's not six the foot same six. player as Seth Curry. Joe he's Harris like, is an actual wing who can yeah, no, incredibly like, switch he, and do and stuff. Yeah. So you have you have one shorter guy, but then you have another guy who's six foot six, a real wing, right? Who's shooting. <laughs> I am on the. Fa- I have no idea what's going on with Ben Simmons. I'm not going to try to get in his head. I'm not going to try to do any of that stuff, but. What I do know is that they could at least get him back on the court and make him a tradable asset again. I don't know if he's going to be a good fit. I think that a volatile team with volatile teammates is the worst possible situation for him. So I could definitely see them moving him again mid-season after building up his trade value and then getting in some pieces that actually do work because that is realistically the only way that you are going to get anybody, anybody besides ring chasers. And let's be honest, after what we just saw, they aren't going to be the kind of ring chasers that are going to the Bucks or to even the Miami Heat. They're going to be going because that's the best ring chaser place left to them. There's reasonably a ring chaser destination. So I don't, I don't see how they become a real bona fide title contender again, unless a lot of things work out pretty well for them. And before even the season plays out, they could trade Ben, ben Simmons for at least whom? for somebody who can get on a basketball court, because at this point availability is, is going to be a, a serious question mark with him. And while I don't necessarily think that he may never play basketball again, 
he may never play basketball in an environment like this again. I think we're going to see him on a mid-market, a mid-level team, uh, like an Orlando Magic, something like that. Uh, you know, maybe looking good, but never necessarily having a real title situation. I don't think he wants that. And if he does, he needs to work on some other stuff first, both on the court and off the court. And I hope that happens. I just don't want it to be on a team that I root for. And I do not want it to be on a team that other people are seriously expecting to to do any winning anytime soon, because that guy's got some stuff to work on both again, on and off the court. And that's just not going to happen in Brooklyn. There have long been some murmurs that Bradley Beal has been a target for the Brooklyn Nets organization. And I could see a world in which the Nets try to find something with the Wizards where they give up Ben Simmons, probably plus something else to get Bradley Beal out there. And Bradley Beal doesn't help with the Nets defensive issues for sure, but he is a basketball player who will be on the court and can score them 20 points a game. I don't think it's over for the Brooklyn Nets. I think it's definitely challenging for them to get back to a contender status. There's a lot of moving parts uh, that Sean Marks is going to need to deal with. But I would just like to point out that the Brooklyn Nets were a one seed until Kevin Durant got hurt this year. Like they were playing at that level. And I think it's reasonable to think that, while it's not likely that Kevin Durant can give you 82 games again, there's definitely a chance that Kevin Durant will be able to give you 60 games again or 65 games. And if Kevin Durant can give you that, then I think just by virtue of how talented this guy is, the Brooklyn Nets are going to be in the mix for a relatively high seed in the Eastern Conference. They have a lot of moves to make, but as long as you have a bona fide locked in top six kind of player, that's always going to help your chances no matter what. So I'm not ready to pour complete dirt on them. I don't think that they are an immediate title contender heading into next year for sure, but there's moves they can make. Bringing back Kyrie Irving would be an absolute disaster. And it's the only thing that is going to happen. So they're stuck with that dude. They're about to pay him a quarter of a billion dollars to go be galaxy brain jackass. Ben Simmons, I cannot imagine a coach and GM getting together and saying, Hey, you know, that Steve Nash treatment where every week you had to lie to the press about the availability of your third best player. Would you like to sign up for that? I cannot imagine a coach and general manager coming together and saying, yes, that would be great. Thank you, Tommy Shepard. I would love to do that. Um, They're the two most poisonous people in the NBA right now. And I can't imagine them getting back real value for that. You want to bring in Bradley Beal, the fourth worst defender in the NBA. Great. He and Kyrie Irving are going to be a hell of a backcourt. I'm sure that that's going to win titles. This team's screwed. It was bad management. It was selfish players making dumb call after dumb call. Look what happened to the Lakers. Two of the NBA's richest, most premier franchises and their players who should not have been made general managers got to serve as general manager and they screwed the pooch. And this is the Celtics Lab podcast, so we can move on. But I love it. I love how unhinged Cam is right now. This is great. <laughs> it's bad for basketball. It's, it's so upsetting. Um, all right. Let's close out. We got about 10 more minutes before we got to wrap up. We can make the assumption with respect to the Chicago Bulls that the Milwaukee Bucks are going to advance barring a disaster. And to that end, they will play the Boston Celtics because of how the conference bracket looks in the East. So we will, uh, I'm sure in the next few days do a full fledged podcast on what that matchup might look like, but let's do rapid thoughts on a Celtics Bucks matchup, and I would like the first bite of this apple. Everything that the Celtics did against Kevin Durant was beautiful. I, again, I likened it to ballet. It won't work in the same way against uh, Giannis. The way that that person puts himself on the court, where he likes to catch the ball, how quickly he can get from 20 feet from the basket to zero feet to the basket is very different than Kevin Durant. I believe strongly in Grant Williams and Uh, and Jason Tatum's ability to stay in front of Giannis as well as anyone might. But this is going to put enormous pressure on Rob Williams and Al Horford and Daniel Tyson's six fouls in a different way. Um, Yes, as long as Chris Middleton is is hurt, the Celtics have, unfortunately, a a roster advantage. And I say unfortunately because the integrity of the matchup is compromised. Um, But the dude who scored 50 points in a closeout game in the, the NBA Finals gets the first and last word. So as excited as I am to have watched the Boston Celtics just destroy Kevin Durant, um, Hurricane Giannis is coming. All right, uh, Alex, Justin, who goes first? 
Off you go. Yeah. So Giannis is a very different matchup for exactly the reasons that you just threw out there. And the one thing about Giannis is that he's going to bring it at both ends every night. There's there's basically nothing that the Celtics can do uh, to stop Giannis when he's rolling. He is that good. What the Celtics can do in this matchup, and I think they might be able to do even more so than they did against Brooklyn, is really punish Milwaukee's bench and role players. The key to this matchup for Boston is not going to be superstar defense. You obviously want to contain Giannis. You don't want him to get 55 and 11 or whatever he's capable of getting. But uh, the key for the Celtics in this matchup will be making sure that the Grayson Allens of the world don't get loose or that Brooke Lopez doesn't come up with like a double-double and a couple of assists or that Bobby Portis isn't out there making key plays and like, uh, you know, mid-range jumpers, things like that. If the Celtics want to win this series, they're going to have to defend this team very differently than they did in Brooklyn, something that I think they can do, but it will require really choking off the role players. And in particular, I think one area that they really need to look into is making Drew Holiday a jump shooter. Drew Holiday is a really good basketball player. He proved that last year in his finals run. Uh, I've been a Drew Holiday fan for a really long time. If there's one weakness that Drew Holiday has, It's that he is not a particularly great jump shooter. So the Celtics are going to need to pack the paint, force the ball into Holiday's hands in late clock situations, and then they're going to need to be able to sprint out and defend the corners, particularly when Grayson Allen, Pat Connaughton, and Bobby Portis are there. I actually like that take very much. Uh, Drew has been shooting not just, you know, as a bad general guard jump shooter but he's shooting under 30 percent last i checked in this first round series against the bulls who have a solid perimeter defense but i mean it's nothing like the celtics so i actually think that in some ways you're right because the who they are going to be defending they're not going to be defending the star player who's available while while Middleton is out but they will be defending the perimeter they will be using the same kind of calculus to to hopefully see uh, mid-range jumpers become the dominant, comfortable shot for the team that they're facing just because they can't afford shooters to match them shot for shot from three-point range in the series and expect to win with Giannis able to basically barrel down and pile pile fouls on your players or end up scoring, basically. So I think that it's actually going to be pretty intense for Daniel Tice. I think you you alluded to to the I think uh, a new front on the war on Tice where he is going to become more of a Giannis foul absorber than anything. If he does more than that, that's great. I, I would love to see him shink, sinking outside shots. I would love to see him passing the ball, sealing off screens, all that stuff. But I think more than anything else, he is going to be a warm body with six fouls. And to that end, I think we may actually see a Sam Hauser appearance because he's got size. He's shown he can defend well enough to kind of stay in front of Giannis and at least absorb a couple of fouls also while being able to shoot, which could be pretty interesting. Alex. There's just one thing I want to jump in. Whereas in this previous series, the Celtics swept the Brooklyn Nets, but all of those games were relatively close, even till the end. I think this series is going to be way more volatile. I think you're going to see blowouts on both sides. I think there's going to be games where the Celtics hit their rhythm on offense. The Bucks' smaller wing defenders can't do anything to stop them, and they can hang 130. And there's going to be games where Giannis is just too much to contain. I have this one. I'll save my prediction for a later date, but I think that um, you could see much, much more variance in terms of how the games go than uh, in this previous series where they were relatively consistent. All right, that's a good enough tease for me. Um, last season, Joe Harris was 127th in defensive wins above replacement player, so whatever that's worth. Um, we'll be coming back soon enough to preview this box series and again, with great respect to the Chicago Bulls, uh, we think it's the Bucks. Um, but whatever happens next for the Celtics, we have you covered at Celtics Lab. Make sure to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Check us out on Twitter and all of that jazz. We will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. 
And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO, and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply.